Today, this is a brown bag with Emily Brooksby Wheeler. She has an MA in History and an MLA in Historical and Cultural Landscapes from Utah State University. <laughs> she teaches Utah History at USU and consults about historical landscape preservation. Her nonfiction work has, been, has appeared in Segula Journal, Pioneer Magazine, and Utah Historical Quarterly. She writes historical fiction as E.D. Willer, including the award-winning No Peace with the Dawn with Jeffrey Bateman about Utah during World War I. Her topic today will be School in War, the Great War and the Transformation of Utah Agricultural College in time for the centennial celebration of the end of World War I. This presentation will look back at how the war to end all wars impacted Utah through the lens of the UAC and Cache Valley. While enlistment frenzies drained the campus of men and left female students preparing to form a legion of death in case of German invasion, civilians on the home front dealt with anti-German sentiment, an influx of outsiders training at the newly expanded college, and the devastation of the influenza epidemic. Thank you, Emma. Thanks. I'm excited to be here this afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I, I enjoy talking about this, about this topic. Um, and uh, I like this lens of looking at it through Cache Valley and the Utah Agricultural College because I think it makes it um, kind of easier to wrap our minds around it a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll talk, uh, at the time USU was Utah Agricultural College, it's the state's land grant university. Um, part of what that means is that military training was supposed to be part of every student's education. In the early days they actually interpreted that to mean the female students as well. Um, I'll have a picture later of some of these women that are in their Victorian garbs with their rifles, they're just, they're ready, <laughs> they're trained. Um, by, by the time that World War I came around, they actually had phased that out for women, though it's going to come back in with our Legion of Death uh, that she mentioned. Um, so, th so the men there are all um, being trained in military tactics. Uh, the male students would have worn uniforms on campus um, many days of the week as part of this. Um, so there was already kind of a military flavor to the, to the agricultural college even before World War I started. Um, and in 1916, we're going to see the ROTC come about, um, of course, with more formal training as well. Um, before the war, before 1914 when the war broke out, um, campus life was pretty you know, typical college life in a lot of ways. Uh, again, you do have that military aspect of it, but we... We've got lots, you know, our sports with uh, baseball and football. Um, the, the football team was really bad. It lost to local high schools. <laughs> but people still went out and cheered for them. Um, they also had some fun traditions, like this is a picture of Loud Socks Day, um, which was um, right before Thanksgiving break. They, all the students would wear their brightest, most obnoxious colored socks, mismatching um, socks, that kind of thing, and they've got, these guys have their pants rolled up so you can see their socks. Um, and they are a band. Um, in fact, they, I think they're meant to be a German band. Um, and they're going to go on parade through campus. Everybody would parade through campus with their ugly socks. Um, and this was just kind of a fun tradition that went on right up until the U.S. entered World War I. After that year, this is going to stop. We're going to see it just die away. Um, and we're not going to hear about it again. It never comes back after this. So just kind of a taste of how things are going to change uh, for these kids on campus. But they're just kind of having fun. At this time, of course, being in college, even now not everybody goes to college, right? But in, at this point, it was, it was a privilege. Um, there's not a lot of funding outside of just whatever your family or yourself were able pr to provide. So these guys are, are privileged, and these girls are privileged to be able to be here. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about that when we talk about their decisions maybe to leave college and go overseas to help with the war effort. 
um, they're giving up something that they had worked hard uh, to achieve. Um, but it's a privilege for them to be there at this time. The, the war, World War I starts at the end of July of 1914. Um, at that point, the U.S. didn't uh, really see it as their problem. Uh, it was kind of a European thing. Um, it didn't, uh, the U.S. wanted to stay neutral, maybe didn't see it having a big impact on them, except maybe in the realms of trade. Um, students on campus were, um, they were concerned about this. They were very aware. I think, I think maybe more aware than we would see in college students today as far as world events goes. Um, they had the, the Student Life newspaper, and I've got a page from it here. Um, they, knew, they knew to some extent what was going on over there. They talked about it. They debated about it. They had articles about it. Um, they, they weren't, we maybe think sometimes of World War I soldiers as being kind of naive, thinking that World War I was going to be glorious, um, this opportunity to have an adventure. Some of them did, uh, some of the Americans who went into it did have a little bit of that attitude, but they weren't naive. They had seen pictures and they'd heard stories about how terrible this was. Um, so, you know, they had the, this idea that it was, um, that it was a, a pretty brutal thing that was going on over there. Um, so they don't necessarily see it as their problem, but they're very aware of it. Um, and they, the Red Cross, uh, there are a lot of Red Cross drives on campus. Uh, not just necessarily for the British and the French, but also for the Germans. Uh, the U.S. wasn't taking sides at this point, and so there is a sense of kind of helping both sides out um, through those kind of through humanitarian efforts. Um, so the students are involved in this um, very heavily on campus. Kind of a debate that's going on, not just on campus, but throughout the U.S., is this idea of peace or preparedness. Um, the U.S. had had a pretty strong peace movement going up into this. Um, this idea of we just don't want to be involved in wars, we want to be, um, we want to be neutral, we want to stay out of it. But there's this other idea, um, so this, this poster here shows this guy, is a, is a, he represents Germany, he's Attila the Hun. Um, I mean, he <laughs> looks not very German, but you know, that's all right. Um, Attila the Hun, and, and his only enemy, it says, is preparedness. So this idea that we have to be prepared not because we want to go fight in the war, but we're, we're afraid the war is coming to us. And when it does come to us, we want to be prepared for that. Um, and we want to um, be able to defend ourselves. Because at this point, the U.S. did not have a large standing army. Um, it, we had less than 100,000 men going into World War I. By the end of the war, we're going to have 4 million men who are drafted. Um, so that's, a, that's a, huge, a huge difference that we're going to have to make up if we're going to fight. Um, and so even before the idea is there that we are going to fight in this war, there's still this concern that we're not prepared. If someone invades us, we're not able to defend ourselves. And a good case in point was um, the Utah militia went down to fight uh, Pancho Villa on the Mexican border and did not um, acquit itself well. <laughs> Some of the men didn't know how to use their rifles. Um, it, was, it was a mess, and it left people very concerned about what's going to happen if someone actually invades us. What's going to happen if we have to fight? We're not prepared. Um, and so there's, it's this ongoing debate. A lot of people with the peace movement said, well, if you're preparing for war, that's just asking to be involved in the war. So that's where a lot of this debate is. Um, this gentleman over here is Moses Cowley. Um, he was a student at the UAC, uh, and he's a good representative, I think, of... Um, kind of how students responded to this. He was kind of a big man on campus. He was involved in a lot of the fraternities and um, things like the debate club, a lot of these activities. Um, and he uh, volunteered to spend his summer at preparedness camps, military preparedness camps. These were started by uh, Leonard Wood and Theodore Roosevelt, who at this point, of course, is a former president. Um, they started these volunteer, non-governmental preparedness camps where young men could go and get military training that in the event that the U.S. did get involved in, in World War I or another war, they would be more prepared to be officers. And so Moses Cowley is one of these that did this. They would have to pay their way. They'd wear maybe their uniforms that they already wore on campus for the training that they did. Um, but, but he would go to Monterey, California in the summers and do this preparedness training. He does end up, in fact, going with, uh, in World War I, going to be an, being an officer. Um, so students were responding to this, um, these debates that are going on, and they're very aware of it. Um, we're going to see quite a few groups affected by the war. One of those groups is uh, Germans, German immigrants. Um, and Logan had, I didn't know this before I worked on No Peace with the Dawn, um, that Logan had 
a huge German-speaking population at this time. Um, if you're familiar with Logan at all, the area between 4th North and 10th North, um, so kind of a, a large section of Logan that's just west of the of USU, of the, of the campus, uh, was called Little Berlin because there were so many German speakers there. Uh, the LDS Church had a German-speaking branch there that was located there. Um, even after the war, some people from that area can remember people getting up and speaking in German in church. So um, <clears throat> this area had a very strong German uh, influence and a lot of German speakers. Most of them actually were Swiss German and not from Germany. Um, but there were, there were Germans as well. And one of those is, is Joe Havertz, this fellow up here. Seems like a, a jolly looking fellow. And um, he was very popular on campus. He was the janitor and he was also the bell ringer back in, you know, when you actually had bells that you rang. Um, he was very skilled. He could play songs on him when he rang the bells. Um, he also was a popular umpire for baseball games. The, the kids liked him. Um, and we see in the Student Life magazines, we see little snippets about him um, that kind of just show that he's this popular um, figure and he's German and people are okay with that. So this, this one is, is a little bit paraphrased, but Kaiser Havertz goose stepped in a circle, planted his feet firmly in American soil, gave the salute and sent the second baseman on his way. This is funny in like 1915. This is okay in 1915. But a couple years later, after the U.S. has entered the war, this is not funny anymore. He does not want to be called Kaiser anymore. He doesn't want to be associated with being German anymore. And so he has a student put this in the paper saying, I'm a loyal American who buys war bonds. That, there's that proof, that proof of what a good citizen he is. And I never so much as tipped my hat to the Kaiser. So a very much a distancing himself from this German heritage. His, we interviewed his grandson. His grandson was not, like did not have any connection with his German heritage, didn't know about these things that had happened during World War I. They didn't talk about it. It was, it was something that became kind of shameful, something that they covered up. Um, Joe Havert's wife um, spoke almost only German. She spoke very little English. But he forbade her from speaking any German, even in the home. It was just German was not allowed. Um, the state actually banned the teaching of German as well. And that LDS uh, German branch was shut down during the war, just very quietly dissolved and, and never seen again. Um, so we see this, th these effects that this is going to have on these people. Um, another group that's going to be affected, of course, is women. Um, there's this idea, this is a time, Utah women had the vote, we've had it for a long time, but uh, women throughout a lot of the rest of the country did not. Um, and one of the arguments against women voting, besides the fact that they weren't smart enough to figure it out, was that those who don't fight don't vote. So, ladies, you're not fighting in the war, so you don't, get to, you don't need to worry about, you know, all these big foreign policy things. You don't have to worry your heads about that. Um, you don't fight, so you don't need to vote. Well, they're going to turn this around when World War I comes around and say, oh yeah, well, we can do our part as well. Um, and within the women's, sort of the women's suffrage movement, there is going to be a debate about, because a lot of these women are also part of that peace movement. And so some of them are going to say, well, we don't want to be involved in a war that we had nothing to do with. This isn't our war and we don't want to be involved with it. And then on the other side, there's going to be the women who say, we're going to prove ourselves. We're going to use this as a way to prove that we have every bit as much a right to say what's going on in the government as the men do. Um, minorities, in a similar way, are going to um, find themselves making very similar arguments. Um, one group in, in Utah that this comes to affect quite a bit is Native Americans. Um, they are at this time, if they're born on the reservation, they're not granted citizenship, and they do not have the right to vote. Um, even if they are, even if they are considered citizens, they're not allowed to vote in Utah um, and in most states at this time. And so some of them, um, when, when federal agents show up on the Shoshone reservation and say, we're here for the draft, there are, there are protests over this because they say, well, we're not citizens. You don't let us vote. Why are you here to do, you know, to do a draft? Um, but others t see it as an opportunity to prove themselves, to say, hey, we deserve to, our citizenship as well. We deserve to be allowed to vote as well. Um, so we're going to see this with, um, again, with minorities throughout the country. A lot of them are going to respond this way. Um, but in Utah, especially, that this is affecting these Native American groups. Um, and this, this picture, I believe, is not, these are not Shoshone, um, but I believe these are code talkers who are not Navajo, 
That's probably, that's what we all think, right? We think World War II and the Navajo Code Talkers. The first Code Talkers were the Choctaws in World War I who worked as Code Talkers. And I believe that's who this picture is of. But that's that, that same thing as they had that opportunity to say, well, we're going to prove ourselves. Um, some tipping points that move the U.S. Um, U.S. opinion against Germany and towards war. Um, the very beginning of the war, um, the war starts with Germany kind of comes up to the, to the border of Belgium and it knocks on their door and says, hi, can we walk through your country to go invade France? And Belgium says, well, we signed a treaty that we're supposed to be neutral and um, we're not supposed to let armies come through and you guys are supposed to leave us alone and stay out, so no. And Germany kind of does a big bad wolf thing. <laughs> it's like, are you sure? We're going to huff and puff. And Belgium says, yeah, we're, we're really sure we're going to stick by the treaty because it's supposed to protect us. Well, Germany uh, violates the treaty and marches through neutral Belgium. Because Belgium resisted, um, Germany decided instead of neutral, they're now going to consider Belgium enemies. And they burned their way through Belgium on their way across. They destroyed towns and cities. They burned thousand-year-old libraries full of medieval manuscripts. Everything in their way, they just burned to the ground. Um, and drove thousands and thousands of refugees in front of them, um, people fleeing into France looking for protection. Um, as word of this gets out, there's a, um, you know, Germany is, is uh, as you would expect, is seen as the aggressor, and people start to be concerned about, I don't know, do we want to support Germany? What they're doing is, is awful. Um, in 1915, we have the sinking of the Lusitania. Um, a lot of us may be learned in school if we remember anything about World War I. We maybe remember the Lus Lusitania, and we think, oh, that's why the U.S. joined World War I. It really wasn't. Um, that happened two years before we joined. But it was another thing, this, the sinking of passenger ships and sinking of um, neutral ships was another thing that started to push us um, away from Germany and towards joining the war with Britain and, and the Allied forces. Um, one thing that is kind of interesting about Lu Lusitania, though, is one of the, some of the passengers on the Lusitania were part of the Gwent Royal Welsh Singers. Um, and this was a group that was like the Beatles of their day. They were super popular, and people turned out in mass to hear these guys sing um, stirring folk songs and, uh, and classical works. And they had come through USU on their tour before they went on the Lusitania. Um, so people were, again, this is a group, people are aware of these guys. Um, the ship sings, a lot of members of the group died. Um, and they, so after, uh, a few of them are rescued, and they come back and they do another tour. And part of this tour, and it comes to USU, it comes through Utah, it comes through a lot of the country, a lot of this tour is, um, they're talking about their experience on the sinking of the ship. They talk about what it was like to be on there in the freezing waters and watching their friends, you know, die and uh, drown in the cold waters. And again, this is going to have a big impact on public opinion as people are listening to these stories. Um, the thing that's going to finally tip the U.S. over is the Zimmerman Telegraph. Um, sent early in 1917, it was um, decoded as, um, it was intercepted and decoded by American cryptologists. And they, they find out that Germany is trying to sort of entice Mexico into a league against us, um, encouraging Mexico to um, invade, and, or at least, to, at least to take Germany's side in the war with the idea that they'll get back what used to be part of Mexico in, in the United States. Um, seeing this happening, the U.S. decides they can no longer ignore the threat of Germany. They can no longer ignore the war. It has become their war as well. Um, so we're going to go to war. April 6, 1917, um, I have this picture up here of the um, Salt Lake Tabernacle because that's where many Utahns were when war was declared. April 6, 1917 was LDS General Conference. Um, so um, it was, a lot of people are gathered there together and a lot of the talks are, are on the subject of how must the Christian fight? Because there's this idea of you're going to have this duty to fight, but at the same time we're talking about being Christian and trying to love people. And so there's a definite conflict there, and they're kind of addressing that as the U.S. is heading into war. But there's no question that this is, this is the duty of the young man is to go and fight. We're all going to support this war effort. Um, and in Utah, there's a little bit more, even more of a twist to it. Utah has only been a state for a little over 20 years at this point. 
And I mean, Utah is already weird, right? Like if you go anywhere and you tell people you're from Utah, they're like, really? <laughs> but at this time, Utah was really, Utah was really weird at this point. And so <laughs> people were just not sure what to think about Utah. And they weren't really sure Utah belonged with the rest of the country. Um, and some people in Utah maybe weren't sure they belonged with the rest of the country either. But this was an opportunity for them to, for Utah to prove itself, to show how patriotic it is and how loyal it is. And we're going to see that with um, both with the, with the men who go over and fight and with the efforts on the home front, this idea of, you know, we're patriotic Americans too, and we are going to do our part and show everybody that we belong. Um, so there's this definite drive, and it sends, again, these, even these kids that are very privileged to have the opportunity to go to college, it's going to drive them to want to enlist and to go and to fight and to be involved to show, I mean, there's a lot of pressure if you don't go, if you don't at least try. There's a lot of people that um, aren't able to go because of health issues. But if you don't at least try to go, then people are going to kind of look at you funny and wonder what's wrong with you. Well, there's a lot of pressure to, to enlist. Um, and it isn't, it isn't very long before the war hits home for Utah. Um, and I don't know, I, I know these two guys are, are going to be the first people from Cache Valley killed in the war effort. Um, some of the things I read said they're the first people from Utah. I, I'm not, like I wouldn't bet my life on that, but um, that was at least what some of the reports were, the first Utahns killed in the war effort. Um, it's, uh, I don't even have pictures of them, I have their graves. Guy Alexander and Claytor Preston. Um, they were best friends. They were in the band at, U, at the UAC and then in the Logan, uh, community band in Logan. Um, they had been married on the same day. Um, they just they kind of done everything together in life. They decide to enlist on the same day. So they go and join up and they end up there in the military band, in the army band. Um, they go down to Fort Douglas for training. They're being shipped back east so that they can go overseas. And in the process, they're in, uh, there's a train accident. Another train comes from behind them, rams into the train that they're in, and kills them and several of the other um, military personnel that are on this train. So they're killed in this accident, and it was um, a shocking event, I think, for Cache Valley. I think it really brought it home in a new way to them um, that they were gonna, they're going to lose people in this war. Um, these guys were buried. They, they have a huge funeral. It, it fills the, the Logan Tabernacle to overflowing. Um, great big procession up to the funeral. Um, so it's a huge, it's this huge thing. It, uh, the, I think the whole community sort of felt brought together and felt affected by it. Um, but it really, it launches into people. I think it gets them this idea that yes, we are involved in this war and it's, it's a serious thing. Um, the, most, of the, most of the men from Utah that joined the Army were in the 91st Division, which is the Wild West Division, um, serving with other um, uh, young men from the, western, the northwestern United States. Um, again, starting to break down some of these barriers between these groups that maybe they haven't interacted with very much before. Um, they were in, a lot of them were in the 362nd uh, Regiment of that division. Um, fought at some, some major engagements in France. Uh, this picture here is from uh, the USU archives. Uh, it's a picture taken by, they, they have pictures in there that were uh, donated that were taken by some of the students who were students at that time who went over and fought and they brought some of these pictures back with us, with them. So we see again this, you know, this is a military funeral that's going on over there in France. Um, Again, bringing home this idea that they're, they're, these Utah boys are out there fighting and dying. And they had a service flag up on campus. It had stars for everybody that was serving. Um, so people are feeling connected to this. Um, very, there's very much a patriotic fervor going on around it. Um, and, and that's going to extend to the home front. Uh, the big job on the home front is to feed the troops. Uh, France has been, France is, um, Farmlands have been devastated by the war. A lot of Europe has been devastated and drained by the war. So America is going to be, this is going to be an important contribution of America is to provide food. And this is where women's job, jobs come in, right? So they're going to they're gonna go out and hoe the gardens and they're going to can food until the boys come back. Don't miss that part. There's this idea of, you know, we know you guys want to vote and stuff and we're going to ask you to do this, but just until the boys come back. This is, just, this is temporary. Don't get all uppity. Um, and they're also asking little kids to eat, you know, cornmeal mush, which sounds fantastic, um, and saving the wheat for the soldiers. There's going to be rationing. 
they don't have ration books in World War I like they do in World War II, but there's that, you know, the meatless days and wheatless days and sugarless days and um, asking people to give these things up. Um, and that's going to be monitored because um, in this idea of here's, here's the things we can do to do our bit, which is a very World War I, everybody's going to do their bit. Um, we're going to knit our bit. I love that one. Um, so if we're not going over there to fight, we're going to do our bit here. Um, there's councils of defense. There's the Liberty Bond drives trying to raise money for the war. Red Cross, women are encouraged, women who are in, like college age women are encouraged to learn nursing. Um, the YMCA, we maybe don't think, I mean when we think of the YMCA we maybe think of the song and the dance or we might think of like it's a cheap place to, to stay if you're visiting another country and you're young and don't mind the accommodations. But um, the YMCA actually sent a lot of people over there to man canteens um, on the front as well. But spying on your neighbors was a big patriotic duty. You need to get out there and spy on your neighbors. You need to make sure they're not communists. That's a big one. Where we're, those communists are going to blow up everything. And the anarchists, they're just waiting for their opportunity to blow up, you know, poison our water supplies and blow up our train lines and things like that. Make sure they're not speaking German. Make sure they're not wasting any food or hoarding meat. You know, we don't want that going on. There's this big push. It's patriotic to spy on your neighbors. Um, and it's just, it's very interesting to see the kind of censorship that went on during World War II. I'm not sure if we've seen the equal of that, maybe during McCarthyism in the 1950s, but it was pretty intense during this time. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to see women who say this is not, this is not enough. This is not all I can do. I can do more. Um, in fact, the, the um, army sees this problem too. The army is not enthusiastic about bringing women in. Um, again, they don't want to give them any uppity ideas or anything. But there are these pink collar jobs that everybody said, oh, those are girl jobs. Boys don't do them. Those are girl jobs. Things like being a telephone operator or a secretary. Well, they need those things over in France, and they need them in the military um, branches. And so they're like, oh, shoot. Okay, we have to use women too. So <laughs> they bring in these girls to be hello girls. These are the telephone operators. They're going to go over to France. and and operate the telephone lines that are connecting the various um, military units to each other. And they're going to bring in clerical workers because they have to. They, there's just not men that know how to do this. They don't want to have to waste the training on the men to have them do that. Um, nurses, of course. There's, al there's always the need for nurses. Um, the Red Cross sends a lot of women over. And then again, the YMCA, as I mentioned. This is a YMCA canteen down here. You can see it's surrounded by sandbags so that it doesn't, if it gets hit by artillery, they have a little bit of protection. There was a 9% casualty rate among the women who went and served with the YMCA. Um, it doesn't seem like that would be a dangerous thing to do, but give, going out there and just, you know, passing out coffee and donuts to these guys coming off the front lines, um, helping them write letters home, um, having books for them to read and things like that. They're, this is a service that they're providing and, and sometimes they were very close to the front lines and there would be accidents um, with artillery and things that would, that would kill some of these women that did this as well. Um, ambulance drivers, women who drove ambulances, um, not only had to be able to drive them but repair them. So this girl's working on our ambulance here. Um, and this woman here is Maud Fitch. Um, She's a Utah woman that went over to be an ambulance driver. Her papers are right here in the archives, and they're very interesting to read. Um, she definitely saw this as an adventure, but uh, it was a duty as well. Um, her, it was, she wanted to be part of this. was her generation's great calling. It was her, their great mission, and she wanted to be involved in that. And so she went over, drove an ambulance, rescued people. She would see like an American plane get shot down, and she would drive her ambulance over these just fields. I mean, there's not even roads at this point. It's just a big muddy mess because it's been bombed and, and marched over so much. And she'd go over and rescue the guy and get him in the ambulance and drive back. And she couldn't go too fast because the, the bumps would hurt the guy, might kill him because of his injuries. But if she went too slow, he might die before he gets to the field hospital. So she actually won the, um, my French isn't very good, so I'm probably going to slaughter this, but the Croix de Guerre, the, um, cross of war from the, fr from the French for her heroism, she got very little recognition from the United States. Um, because again, there's a sense of like women weren't, even the women who served with the army as nurses weren't recognized as veterans for a long time after this. Um, but she went out there, she wanted to do that part to be like, hey, we can do this too. And these women who went as volunteers were not only risking their life and maybe putting college or family or other things on hold, 
Um, of course, they're not getting paid, but they're also paying their own way to do this, the women who go as volunteers. So Maud Finch had to pay her own way. She paid for her own ambulance. Her father was a wealthy mine owner, so she could do this. But even some of these girls that went with like the YMCA, they have to pay their own way to do this. They're paying to volunteer and go and help out. So it clearly was something that meant a lot to them and they wanted to be involved in it. Um, coming back to, to campus, to the, it should be UAC, um, the Utah Agricultural College, um, has a military training center. Um, E.G. Peterson um, was, a, was the brilliant mind behind um, the UAC during both um, World War I and World War II. He was president of the university for both of those wars. And what Utah State is today owes a lot to him. Um, because he, um, a lot of colleges were a little panicked about the number of men leaving during this time, but he looked at it and said, well, the military is going to have to train all these kids, right? I mean, some of them don't even know how to, like, how to hold a rifle, so they're going to need training. And so he goes and talks to people, and they say, yeah, we'll use your campus as, train as a training ground. Um, I mean, there's still some women there taking classes, but just put them in the domestic science building, and we don't have to worry about them. Um, you guys have all this open space, it's great, and they say, we're going to build these nice wooden barracks, and he says, wait, why don't we make them out of brick? They'll, you know, they'll just be a little more sturdy that way. And they say, okay, we'll do brick barracks. Well, those brick barracks are still there as classrooms at University, uh, Utah State University, um, because he had, he just, he had the foresight to say, let's make this permanent. You know, if we're going to do this, let's make it, and then it's going to benefit the university in the long run. And all these programs that come in, all this training, mechanics and radio and things like that, that they're bringing in people to teach, when the war is over, some of those programs are going to stay there. And so he uses this, this brilliant opportunity um, to bring these resources in and kind of fix them to campus and help the campus grow. Um, so very clever the way he handled that. Um, he also went on to help draft the GI Bill as well. So. Um, he may be a name that, unless you're familiar with USU history, you may not be very familiar with him, but um, he did have a big impact on um, military and also on, on campus. Um, looking at campus, what, what things were like on campus at the time, um, if you've been up to Old Main on, um, at USU, um, of course it was just the main building at the time, and it wasn't old yet, um, but this is one of the basement classrooms. And so all the classrooms, they pull the classes out of them, and fill them up with bunks for the, for the soldiers. So soldiers are bunking in, in Old Main, um, training out on, on the quad and, and sleeping in the classrooms. Um, and this, um, one of the big groups that's coming in, these are, out, you know, people coming, these are already, already, let's see if I can use the right word, they're already enlisted, they're already drafted um, in the military, and they need more training before they're sent overseas. And so, especially this um, group from Wyoming comes, and Cash Valley's like, whoa, Wyoming, like cowboys, and they drink, and I, I don't know if we can, I don't know if we can do this, guys. I don't, I mean, Wyoming is like 30 miles away or something, but they were kind of panicked about. It. There's all these articles in the newspaper that are like, it's okay, guys, we can do this. It's gonna be all right. Don't be afraid of the Wyoming guys. Um, but they, so they come, and Cash Valley's like, okay, they look, you know, pretty normal. I think we can handle this. But they end up, they, they do end up sort of opening up their homes to these guys, and there's, um, they have dances, and the, the women would bake, like, pies. Like, each guy would get his own pie. They'd, like, bring them apple pies, so each, each kid would get his own one. And they'd invite them for dinner, and so they do end up being good hosts to this, to this group. But there was this fear of, like, like, they're from Wyoming. It's, it's so close. I don't know. It seems so funny to me that they were so scared of these guys from Wyoming coming in. But it was just outsiders, and it was a whole bunch of them. They weren't used to it and didn't know if they were going to just be, you know, be wild and party all the time, I guess. But um, so there's, there's a lot of tension, though, on the community having to, to deal with these changes. Um, but that, it turned out just fine. They were okay. Um, another training program that goes on is the Student Army Training Corps, the SATC. Um, some people also said that those initials stand for, stood for safe at the college. Mm -hmm. These were kids that, were, that could be drafted. Um, they were old enough, um, but they didn't have any like military skills really beyond just being a warm body. 
And so they would come to this, they would, they would join the Student Army Training Corps and get training before they went into the Army. Um, and it would be, you know, training in engineering or mechanics or things like that. They were going to be useful when they go into the Army. But these were kids that would not normally have had an opportunity to get any college training. They wouldn't have had the money or the educational background. And again, this is E.G. Peterson saying, how can we, you know, how can we help these guys out? We're helping the university and helping these kids by giving them this training that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And so they're here, um, and this is, I think, the basement of what's like the Ray B. West building now up on campus, um, just eating lunch. And the girls that are in the domestic science program are cooking dinner for them because they're still there on campus. They're still trying to get their degrees, but they're just kind of put to work in these various areas. I guess they're getting very practical experience. Um, but yeah, they're having this opportunity that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And a lot of them, because the war ends quickly enough after the US gets involved, a lot of them never have to go fight. Um, so they have this opportunity to get this extra experience and extra training, and um, it doesn't end up risking. I mean, they were willing to take that risk, but they didn't end up having to. So it was a great opportunity for them. Um, and then we have, I could not find a picture of the women training to be in the Legion of Death. I really would love a picture of that, but I couldn't find one. So this is that picture I mentioned that's the, um, these Victorian ladies with their rifles that are doing the drills. And they're just like, they're ready to go. So when the Germans come marching in, and all the guys have already fought, and I guess all the guys are dead. They've just, they've gone out and given their lives for the cause. And the Germans are coming over through Logan Canyon or whatever. This, this, these girls that are, that are trained to be the Legion of Death are ready to, like, they're the last, the last stop between Logan and, and the Germans. Um, so this is what they did instead of PE. They stopped having PE classes. And they start training the women. And they, they, they called it the Legion of Death. Um, and I just, I think that's fantastic. I think it's so fun. Um, but yeah, so that's what they were training to do as well. So everyone is involved in this. Everyone on campus is having this military training and this experience that we're all involved with this. Um, and then we get the influenza, right? Um, and this is, it's called the Spanish flu. It didn't start in Spain. It actually started in the United States, they think. It was called the Spanish flu because Spain was not involved in the war, and it was the only country that was telling the truth about how bad it was. Um, and this was, this was gruesome. The, this influenza was gruesome. People would, um, maybe I won't, you guys are supposed to be having lunch, so I won't go into the, the details of it, but it was bad. <laughs> um, and it starts in the U.S., and because of all this, military training that's going on and these guys moving all across the country, they take it with them. And so it maybe wouldn't have been such a big thing, like it wouldn't have, have maybe been so deadly, but because it's getting spread around and uh, mutating, it, it becomes very deadly throughout the United States. And then they're going to take it over to Europe as well. And it's going to spread through Europe, especially where you have all those guys that are in cold conditions and they're not getting enough to eat and, you know, undernourished and, and, and under stress. And so they're very susceptible to it. And this particular um, uh, strain of the influenza especially affected young people. The thing that killed you with this was your own immune system overreacting to it. So people with strong immune systems would actually be the ones that were most likely to die. And so it's these college age kids, these military age kids are the ones that are dying the most from it. And it's just it's awful as it spreads. Um, entire U.S. cities shut down. New York City is shut down. Philadelphia is shut down. The streets are empty. Um, people are inside. There are no, you could literally, like, if most of the doctors and nurses have been shipped overseas, if people think that you might be a doctor or a nurse, you might be kidnapped and brought <laughs> into somebody's home to try to help their family because there's nobody to, to help them. Um, and so entire families are dying. Um, they're doing these, you know, they find these from time to time, these mass graves where people were just buried because there were just so many of them. Um, so it's this really awful, gruesome thing that uh, goes to the U.S., especially the East Coast cities. Um, by, the time, by the time the influenza gets to Utah, it has mutated a little bit more, they think, maybe, and so it's a little weaker. Um, it still has terrible effects in Utah. Um, but either because, and on the West Coast, but either because we don't have as many big cities or because the, the, the flu has changed a little bit, we don't get like the mass graves and things that you would see uh, back East. Um, a lot of public things are still shut down though. Um, it goes, it gets on campus. Um, again, among all those young men and young women that are there training, 
Old Main is turned into a hospital. Um, all the training is shut down. Everything on campus is shut down. The newspaper, you can read in the newspaper and it just stops. There isn't any like, people are starting to get sick. Like there's no hint of it coming. It just, the, the publication, the newspaper stops. Everything shuts down because they're trying to contain the spread of this. And at the same time, they're trying to convince people that it's not as bad as people know that it is. <laughs> they're being like, it's, some people died today from influenza, but don't worry about it. That, it, it it's going to be fine. It, that was, those were the last ones, I promise. Uh, and just this, uh, when we talk about maybe, I know people didn't trust the government completely before this time, but there's a big breakdown with the trust of like, the government's lying to us and the newspapers are lying to us and we can look around and see that these things are happening. So as we look at the effects of some of this, of what's going on with World War I, that's going to be one of them is this kind of like, who do we trust? Because these guys are lying to us about how bad this is and we can see that they're lying to us. Um, Influenza was another, it was an interesting one because it comes, it's October 1918 that it comes to Utah during General Conference weekend again. <laughs> so a year and a half later, um, and, and so it spreads again, we, people from all over Utah have come to Salt Lake City. Um, it, there's the, the outbreak, they, they first realize it in Fort Douglas, um, that there's this outbreak, but it spreads in Salt Lake City and then everybody takes it home with them. Um, you know, but it shuts everything down. And then on this slide I have, so you can kind of see here, this is, this is a graph of U.S. deaths um, overseas. And so we're losing people, right? We're losing people, and then the flu hits. <laughs> That's the effect that the influenza had on the armies overseas. So, and I think this is like thousands, like per day, or per week maybe, um, depending on how they're, how they're breaking that down. But you can see the difference between like, we were losing people, we had casualties, but when that flu hits and it's there in September, that's when it kind of gets ships o shipped over there with, with soldiers who were infected with it. I mean, and it just, it just devastates. Um, not just our army, but all of the, the, all of the armies. Some people think that's one of the reasons that the, the war wrapped up when it did. Some of it was the American offensives that were going on and the, uh, the more aggressive tactics that the Americans were using. Um, but some of it was just people were, people were tired of it, and then this hits, and they're just done. They're losing so many people. Uh, this is a picture at the Logan, um, the Logan train depot that was up there. It's now a, a Mexican restaurant, Cafe Sabor. It's great if you're up there, try it out. And it's kind of fun to eat in the old train depot. But this is what it was like 100 years ago. These women, and this would have been in early 1919, as uh, men are starting to come home from the war, uh, people are greeting them at the train station, but this is how they're dressed because they're still worried about the flu going around. So they, they felt and they believed that if they wore these sort of long white gowns with a face mask that it would kind of help the flu not spread. It doesn't look like it really helped that much, but this is how people would have dressed if they were going out and especially meeting these soldiers because, you know, you don't know if they're sick or not either. Um, so this is what the soldiers came home to was this, was this look. Um, of these women that are just, <laughs> they've got some apples or something there for them, but they're very, very protected from that worry about the flu still. Um, so that brings us to the armistice. Uh, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month uh, was when it, when it was enacted. Um, the armistice, you, Germany definitely took the blame and they had reparations that they had to pay, but it was kind of more of a ceasefire than a like we win. Um, and you can just, it's just like a timeout until we go into World War II. That's really what it was. Um, you appreciate that more and more, the more you understand about World War I. Like everything that happened in World War II happened in World War I, but just not as bad as it, as it would be in World War II. Yeah, I guess except the trench war warfare. That was, that was World War I's own terrible thing that they had and the influenza. But, um, but yeah, so it's just kind of just, we're going to take a timeout for a generation and then get back into this fight later. Um, but we come out of it, Utah comes out of it, um, a lot more integrated with the rest of America. Utah is showing people that it's patriotic, it's proven it's patriotism, um, and Utahns and other Americans have had a chance to interact with each other more. Um, there's still some people today that think that Mormons have horns, but maybe fewer people after this believe that, that, that is over a hundred years old, that belief. Um, there's also the belief that Utahns practice free love. Um, that was sort of uh, dispelled, <laughs> maybe through some unfortunate interactions with people 
propositioning each other and it didn't go well or whatever. But um, so some of these kind of ideas that people had are broken down just by interacting with people and getting to know them and being like, oh, they're not that different from us. Um, so Utah ends up more integrated. A lot of these guys come back with what they called shell shock at the time. We would now recognize as PTSD. Um, there wasn't a good understanding. There was not a lot of sympathy for it. It was just kind of a, they just would tell the guys, oh, just get over it. Or, and the women, too. I'm sure some of the women that were out there on the front probably suffered from it as well. But they would just say, hey, get over it. You know, you're fine. Move on with your lives. And people tried to. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, they suffered from it still, but they kind of were expected to suffer in silence. Uh, the war's over. We're all going to move on now is kind of the approach that people took. Um, Utah did make a lot of sacrifices. We lost over 600 people um, just from Utah. But there, there wasn't a lost generation in Utah. Like if you look at France and England and Germany, you can talk about this lost generation where so many people, so many young men died. Um, millions, millions of people died. And we, we don't have that as much. And I think maybe that's why we don't remember it as much as those other places do. You know, right now, if we were over there, there's these huge commemorations going on. Um, and we're doing this, which is great, but we're not, rem we don't, it doesn't have that, it didn't have that impact on our like national psyche as um, the way that it did in other places. And I, I think some of it is just because we weren't in it as long, we didn't lose as many people. Um, but we did lose some of our idealism. Um, just one of the effects of coming out of World War I, it sort of ended that progressive age where we think science is going to make everything better and we're going to fix all the problems in the world. And we kind of come out, came out of this and said, whoa, <laughs> science isn't always pretty. And maybe we don't have all the answers. And um, we maybe don't trust as much as we did. And we've kind of seen the really ugly, horrible things that people can do to each other. Um, so some of that idealism that existed before, we're not going to see that again. We're going to move into sort of postmodernism and things like that. And, and really just the, like our society as we know it today was born at this time. Um, the idea of wanting to be isolationist and the peace movement, those things are going to be strengthened, which of course is going to help with uh, World War II. It's going to help that occur because nobody wanted to step in and start another war again. So people kind of step back and let Hitler get away with too much before they stepped in. Um, I, I mentioned before sort of more distrust of, you know, n newspapers and, and politicians maybe aren't, we, maybe we can't trust them, maybe we don't know if they're telling us the truth. Um, and we're going to go into the Roaring Twenties. And that might seem like we might look, at, look back at that and say, well, that seems kind of fun, you know, the flappers and the jazz age, and, um, and those things seem fun. But they really were, it was a different sort of, it's not loud socks days anymore, right? It's not this kind of fun parade through campus with our silly socks on. It's this sort of desperate escapism almost, this idea of we've been responsible, we did our duty like you told us to do, and now we're done. We're, we're going to go out and party and have fun and not have to worry about any of that responsibility um, <clears throat> that you told us it was our duty to, to be involved in. Uh, so even though we might look at World War I and, and it's, it's very overlooked and we don't talk about it very much, don't think about it very much, um, it really did have a big impact. Uh, it transformed U, uh, um, the Utah Agricultural College eventually into Utah State University. Um, it, again, it brought Utah more into the into the concerns and the, the spheres of the, the rest of the country. Um, and it, it changed life in America as well, even in ways that we maybe don't think about. Are there any questions? Yeah. When you mentioned that the women, like the ambulance drivers in that paper, in the canteen, the YMCA canteen, mm -hmm. the paper when we get there. So, so did all of them have to buy their own ambulance or just? Did you mention that one gal did? Yeah, Maud Finch did. Um, I, I'm under the impression that Maud Finch maybe got taken advantage of a little bit, like maybe she wouldn't have had to have done that. Um, so I think some people, when they got over there, found ambulances ready, like waiting for them. Um, so that, I think, might have been a bit of an unusual situation just because they said, oh, well, she's, she's got the money and she's willing to spend it. Um, but certainly, I think she probably wasn't the only one that did that. And then you said, Pete Girls? Hello Girls. Hello Girls, yeah. yeah. I think that I think for the hello girls and the nurses the military did pay for them but they weren't recognized as veterans yeah yeah okay oh yeah Walt Disney drove one yeah so there were some that were they used money that 
corporations were like, let's donate to the government. Yeah. Versus, you know, patriotic. <laughs> yeah, so there's worse. I mean, and I think some of them are just turned over by hospitals and different companies over, overseas as well. Yeah. So you talked about um, the poster with the women doing farm work. In yeah. So what was the major crop in Cash Valley during that time? Hmm. Sugar beets? They did have sugar beets and they had peas as well, like like sweet peas. Um, and dairy would have been a big one in Cache Valley at that time. So that, that picture was from out of, like from out of state. Um, but those would have been the main things. But Cache Valley grows a lot of hay and at the time also grew a lot of hay, but it tends to be dry farming because it's pretty dry up there. <laughs> so yeah. Oh yeah. I know they were still using animals in the war, mm -hmm. horses and donkeys and all of those things. Yeah. Were you shipping things like hay over, or was that like... That's a good question. Hay. That's a good question. I don't know. I know we shipped food. I don't know if we ever shipped hay. I think by the time that... I mean, we were shipping stuff over there. When we were supposed to be neutral, we were still sending stuff over as well. Um, it's possible that we did, because it's not like they would have been able to grow a lot of it. Uh, on their own over there, but by the time that the U.S. was really involved, they weren't using animals so much anymore because they'd realized that it was just. Of course, one of the pictures I, I don't I don't include it because it's kind of gross, but one of the pictures that's in that U.S.U. archive is a picture of a dead horse like hanging out of a tree because the artillery had blown it into the tree and it was just stuck there. Yeah, yeah, it does. It was it was pretty. They were trying to use animals in a war that. Not that anybody ever belongs in war, but it was really like you get this weird synthesis of like they're trying to use these really old fashioned methods of warfare and this really new like tanks and artillery and the, like the Big Bertha, the Germans' Big Bertha artillery was the first, um, was the first one ever to, let me see, think, was it the first one to break the sound barrier or the first one to like, like crest up through the atmosphere, but it, they're starting to get into the stuff that's going to like be important during the space race and things like that. You know, this figuring out how to how to really shoot things far, and but they can shoot it from you know miles and miles away. So they have all this this new technology that they're using and developing, but at the same time they've got you know horses pulling wagons. So and some of the ambulances, some of the early ambulances were horse drawn as well. So yeah. Was because the mud was so thick, yeah. the closer you got to the front, so the cars would run perfectly if there was a road. Yeah. 90% there were no roads, so they would bring, have to bring the horses in to pull the ambulances <laughs> out of the mud, and then the ambulances would run, and like it was like a chain thing that they had to do often. Yeah. Um, and that lasted uh, through most of the war, because the, even down to the tanks, where the tanks mm -hmm. couldn't run through the mud, it was a problem. Yeah, it had been so churned up after so long, and the... Um, the most popular ambulances were actually Ford's because Ford had a higher carriage than a lot of other cars. So a lot of these trucks and cars that had been converted into ambulances, the Fords were the most popular. There were tons of jokes, like if you read the student life paper, um, like one of the jokes is, I know a girl named um, Iona who changed her name. And the other one says, well, that doesn't seem like such a bad name. Why did she change her name? And they said, well, because her last name is Ford. Mm -hmm. So. So <laughs> there's a lot of there are a lot of Ford jokes in the paper, but Fords ended up being the most reliable because of that high clearance. They didn't get stuck as much. Um, but yeah, there's that definite like weird technology gap that was going on. <laughs>